to ask random passers-by if they believe they'll go to heaven, the answer would likely be yes. But is that just a comforting story that people tell themselves? How can we be sure about our own eternal destiny? Alistair Begg answers that question today on Truth For Life as he continues our study in 1 Corinthians 15. The Christians in Corinth needed to be reminded of the fact of their own resurrection, that they too were going to be raised to eternal life. And so what Paul does is before he addresses this fact in verse 12, he begins by rehearsing a series of undisputed facts. He says, now let's lay down the things upon which we're all agreed. And in the first 11 verses, he simply lays down these foundational elements of truth. And he gives them, he says, a reminder of the gospel. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you have received, upon which you have taken your stand, and through which you are saved. Now, why would Paul have to remind them of the gospel? What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the good news. He articulates it in verse 3 and following. Here is the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and he appeared. And it is this message of the gospel which, when it takes hold of the life of a man or a woman, transforms them from the realm of merely religious individuals to those who have been brought near by the power of Jesus Christ to the reality of faith in him. Like in Wesley, long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Your eye diffused a quickening ray. When I get to heaven, I want to ask where he got this idea from. I mean, what is uh, the diffusion of a quickening ray? Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, and I woke, and my dungeon was flamed with light. I I got up and I said, Woo! This is what he's talking about. And I thought he was talking about you just go. You get points for going. I thought he was talking about you try your best, and if you've done your best, you'll get there. I thought what he was saying was try and pull your socks up. But no, this is what he was talking about. This is what happened to Charles Simeon in the 19th century. He was a vicar in Cambridge in England, in Holy Brompton Church in England. He was as religious as any guy in England, but he wasn't converted. And when he was preaching his sermon, all of a sudden the truth struck him. And somebody shouted from the back of his congregation, the pastor's been converted. (laughs) And he had to stop and admit that he was converted in his own sermon. He was telling them about stuff that he didn't even know himself. So you see, That is why it is so exciting to sit under the Word of God. That is why it is so exciting to pray for people who are opening themselves up to the Word of God, because we know that God will use His Word and the prayers of His people to bring out of the dungeons and out of the darkness. And the key to it all is the gospel. Sorry about that. That was a bit of a sermon there all on its own. Now, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, you get the same thing. What is he talking about? Galatians 1, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are trying to throw you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. He said, but listen carefully. You need to know what the gospel is, because if you don't know what the gospel is, someone will come along with another gospel, and you're so stupid, you'll think that's the gospel as well. You'll take the plain dealer religious page, and you'll read all that, and you'll believe it. Then when you do that, and you come and tell me that, I know one thing. I need to labor longer and harder and clearer until you dear folks understand the gospel. And we thank you. And when you understand that, then you will be able to detect currency, which is fraudulent. You go to the book of Ephesians. It's all the gospel. Go to Philippians chapter 1, 5. Philippians 1, 5, I am very confident and thankful for the opportunity of praying for you and because, he says, of your partnership in the gospel. You go to 1 Thessalonians. Actually, you go to Colossians 1, 6. Talking about the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and is growing, he says. You go to 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1 and verse 5. 
because our gospel came to you not simply with words. You go to Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. That conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is the entrusted to me. Second Timothy, which is the last letter that he wrote, 2 Timothy 1 verse 8. Don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. Verse 11, And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. It's all gospel. It's all gospel. You turn back lastly to Romans and look at this so clearly. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Listen to him. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. He then goes on to show in the remainder of chapter 1 and into chapter 2 that we've got a pressing problem, irrespective of our background. And the problem is this that all of us are accountable, that all of us are in the same predicament, that all of us are confronting a no-entry sign, and there is no way that we can make ourselves acceptable to God. He says in verse 20 of chapter 3, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Isn't that the truth? You go to church and they give you more of the law. You're supposed to do this, and you're supposed to do that, and you're supposed to do the next thing. The person goes out and says, The devil, I can't do this stuff. If I've tried, I had my best week last week, and I didn't even come close to what I was supposed to be doing. Best week I've had in a long time. And if I'm going to get up these stairs to heaven, man alive, I'm going to have to pull up the socks, take off the jacket. I don't know what I'm going to have to do. We see what that person's in need of is some gospel, some good news. What's the good news? The good news is this, that although the road is flooded out and there is apparently no way through, there is one who stands ready with a way of escape to take you through. In Los Angeles, so many roads were closed as a result of flooding. We kept coming to signs which simply said, road out, no way, no through road, can't do, you're done. And there was a point at which we went round about three or four different streets and we couldn't get anywhere except where we were. And so we couldn't go to where we wanted to go as a result of all the blockages that were in between. And then we discovered that somebody had cleared a way and made it possible for us to go through in safety. That's the good news as a result of sin, as a result of our rebellion, as a result of the fact that I haven't loved God with all my heart and all my mind and all my soul and all my strength, whether I'm a very very good guy with a little bit of sin or a very bad guy with a lot of sin, I'm still in this predicament. And all of my best efforts to earn acceptance with God will eventually lead to nowhere. So I'm in deep trouble unless there's some good news coming from somewhere. Guess what? There is. That's the gospel. Jesus, once and for all, in his death upon the cross, bore the punishment I deserve, took the pain that is rightly mine, took my place, and in so doing, bore the punishment of sin. And when God, in his grace, opens up my clouded eyes to this truth, I can do no other than run away to him and say, Save me. Now, when you turn back to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul summarizes it in just a matter of words. In verse 3, he says, What I received I passed on to you as of first importance. And here you have it, Christ died for our sins. And it wasn't an afterthought. It was according to the Scriptures. In other words, you read the Old Testament, and you discover that hundreds of years before Christ, it was looking forward to the death of Jesus. Isaiah 53 is a classic illustration of it. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, says Isaiah. Each of us has turned to his own way. We're all doing our own thing. We're all going our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Now, Isaiah didn't understand the fulfillment of this prophecy. Indeed, it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, that the prophets, when they spoke, constrained by the Spirit of God, were like men on tiptoes, waiting to see how it would be fulfilled. But he writes and he says, all of us are messed up. All of us are going our own way. The Lord has purposed to have a suffering servant, a Messiah who will come, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Paul says, here we have it. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, you see, when you tell this to a skeptic, they merely view the scene on Calvary, and they scoff. When you share this with the sentimental, they shield their eyes and simply feel sorry for the dying preacher. But when you tell this to the sinner, to the individual who has been aware, made aware of their sin, has come to understand that they are without hope and without God in the world, has come to realize that what drives them from the inside are the cravings of their sinful nature, has come to see that they're just moved en masse by the ways of the world and they cannot disentangle themselves. They are stirred and moved by all of this. When you spell this out for that individual, then it is like water in a dry land. And you see, the task of the preacher is simply to spell it out. The work of God is to bring the hearts of men and women to an understanding of their dead-end street. And when they're at that point of greatest concern, the news that someone has opened up a way to them is something to which they must run. When Paul describes the Ephesians' experience, he says, you know, in Christ you were once— in Jesus Christ, you who were once far away— have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Now, says Paul, this is the message. It is the gospel. This is what I preach to you, you'll notice in verse 1, which you in turn have received and on which you have taken your stand. And he says, it is by this gospel that you are saved, and only by this gospel. There is no other good news. You can go to Buddha's tomb. You can go and find where Muhammad was buried. You can find Gandhi's tomb. You can find Krishna. But the distinctive part about the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth is that it is an empty tomb. And Paul says, when you look at that empty tomb, and when you ask, what is the significance of a resurrected Christ, it is that the resurrection finds its significance upon the cross, and the cross declares its applicability in the resurrection. Now, can I say to you this morning, dear ones, that you must examine the Bible to see whether what I'm telling you is true. If there is, you see, a variety of ways to go to heaven, then it's silly for me to get as concerned as I am today about you. If, for example, you may go to heaven just because you were baptized, then I would be better off having a big sort of mass baptism thing. If you can go to heaven simply as a result of showing religious interest, then we will give you cards as you leave which say, Mr. and Mrs. X have been showing a great deal of religious interest lately. If you can go to heaven simply as a result of having come from the right kind of background and engaged in the right kind of things, then it is foolishness to speak as I address you this morning. And so you must examine this book to see if what I say is true. And I affirm to you on the authority of this book that if you do not respond to the gospel as is declared in this book, then you will die in your sin and spend eternity in hell. And if you believe that it is possible to make entry by another route, be careful. 
Jesus says in Matthew 7, I want you to enter in at the narrow gate, which leads to the narrow road, which leads to life. I want you to forsake the broad road, which leads to destruction, which is ap amply populated, but it leads down to hell. John Bunyan got it as good as anybody in Pilgrim's Progress, which is probably the second book we should all read after our Bibles. And in Pilgrim's Progress, after he has dealt with a few guys by the name of Simple and Sloth and Sleep and Presumption, uh, funny fellows, he then encounters two chaps. I can't tell you the whole story this morning. We did it with the children some years ago. It was, it was a great hit. In fact, it was a great hit with the adults. I'm not sure the children got much out of it, but the adults did learn. But Pilgrim is on the way, the narrow road to heaven. And he says, and I'll just upgrade this for our understanding, he says that when he bade farewell to these four characters whose names I've just mentioned, he saw two men come tumbling over the wall on the left hand of the narrow way. The name of one was formalist, and the name of the other was hypocrisy, and they caught up with uh, Pilgrim as he was walking, and as they caught up with him, he entered into conversation with them. And he said to them, he said, hey guys, uh, where did you come from, and where are you going? And they said, oh, we came from over there, and we're going to the heavenly city. So Pilgrim says to them, he said, didn't you see the gate down at the end here, where you're supposed to come in? Don't you know that it is written, he says, that he that cometh not in by the door, but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber, which is a quote from John chapter 10, verse 1. And the two fellows respond by saying, listen, the people that go down to the gate for entrance are wasting an awful lot of time. You don't have to go way down there. It's far easier, they said, to take a shortcut. Just jump over the wall. This is a great spot for getting over the wall. So Pilgrim says to them, Will it not be counted a trespass against the Lord of the city where we're going to violate his revealed will? I mean, if he says there's only one way it's through the gate and you're coming over the wall, don't you think that'll be a problem when you get to your destination? Formalists and hypocrisy respond, Hey, you don't need to trouble your head about that. Because people have been doing this for hundreds of years. Thousands of years people have been climbing over the wall here. So, says Pilgrim, will your practice stand trial at the law? And what they essentially say is this, as long as a lot of people are doing it, and as long as it's been happening for a long time, we're pretty well convinced that when we get to the bar of God's judgment, we'll be able to say, we know there was a gate, we know there was a way, but we tumbled over the wall, and guess what? Us and a whole big crowd of people. And you're surely not going to throw us all out, are you? There is safety in numbers. To which Pilgrim replies, Oh, listen to what they say. This is good. They said, If we get in the way, what matter is it which way we get in? If we're in, we're in. We see that you came in at the gate. We came tumbling over the wall. What makes your condition better than ours? And this is exactly what they say to us. They say, listen, Al. Listen, Parkside. What is this stuff about having to admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus Christ, and cry out to him for mercy? We're good religious people. Why do you have to get onto this stuff? We're all, we're all in it. We're all on the way. We're all fine. I mean, don't make a big fuss about your gate. You can say that if you want. Just don't say it too loudly. We tumbled over the wall. Us and thousands of others. And now you're telling us who tumbled over the wall that we're in deep difficulty because we didn't come through the gate. We don't like that. I mean, we want to come to your church and we want to like you people and we want to sing and do the thing, but we don't want this gate stuff. No gates. You understand that? We don't want the gates. We are the tumblers. And what does it matter as long as you're in, you're in. Over the wall, through the gate, who cares? To which he replied, I walk by the rule of my master. You walk by the rude working of your fancies. You are counted thieves already by the Lord of the way. Therefore, I doubt whether you will not be found true men at the end of the way. 
You come in by yourselves without his direction and shall go out by yourselves without his mercy. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is wide open that you may go in. At Calvary's cross, that's where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. The redeemed sinner says, wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, and now I am free. All because Jesus was wounded for me. A message titled, The Good News of the Resurrection, from Alistair Begg and Truth for Life. Alistair will return in just a minute, so please keep listening. To hear this program again, or if you'd like to share it with a friend who has not yet placed his or her faith in Christ, visit truthforlife.org. There's no greater gift we can give someone than the gift of the gospel, because it is through the teaching of God's Word that the Holy Spirit draws men and women to salvation. For that reason, we're dedicated to providing clear, relevant Bible teaching without cost ever being a barrier. But we're only able to do that because of listeners like you, listeners who provide the necessary financial support. And when you become one of our truth partners, someone who commits to giving monthly, or when you make a generous one-time gift, we'd like to say thank you by sending you a fun and engaging resource, something that will help you share the important message of the gospel with your children or your grandchildren, a Sunday school class. This is a 14-day study that will help lead up to Easter. It's titled Mission Accomplished. And as you read it, you and your children will follow Jesus' journey through Passion Week to the cross and beyond. If you'd like to become one of our truth partners and request your copy of the book titled Mission Accomplished, call 888-588-7884. Again, that's 888 588 7884, or request a copy of the book when you give online at truthforlife.org slash truthpartner. Now, before we conclude, here's Alistair with a final thought. Where you are today, without any fancy flowery language, you can cry out to God from your heart, Oh God, I understand it now. This is good news. I've been trying this stuff. I've been trying, 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 and now I understand it. You did it for me. And I want to trust in nothing and no one else save Jesus. And for those of us who profess to follow after Christ, let's take this word of reminder and translate it into action, into daily action, so that not in a bombastic or unkind way, but graciously, with words that are full of grace and seasoned with salt, speaking the truth in love, we may proclaim, as did Paul, the good news. Grant that the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our minds may prove acceptable in your sight today. For Jesus' sake, we ask it. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine. Scripture makes it clear that we are saved by faith alone, and yet it's possible to believe the gospel is true without ever being changed by that knowledge. So what's the difference between mere belief and saving faith? Alistair addresses that critical question on Friday. This daily program featuring the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life, where the learning is for living.